Hello, everyone, and welcome to our latest program in our President's Interview Series, Catching the K Investment Wave in the USA. We are fortunate to be joined by a distinguished panel of experts uh, to discuss the dynamic Korean investment in the United States, an important economic dimension, and the multifaceted multi uh, bilateral relationship between the two countries. Andrew Day, Vice President, Head of Strategy at Jobs Ohio. Uh, Harry M. Lightsey III, Secretary of Commerce of South Carolina, Department of Commerce. And Pat Wilson, uh, Commissioner of Georgia Department of Economic Development are our guests today. I'm Tom Byrne, President and CEO of the Korea Society, and I'd like to share a bit more about our panelists. Uh, Andrew graduated from, the, from Georgetown University with a bachelor's degree in business administration and obtained a master's degree from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He joined Jobs Ohio in 2015 and leads strategy, global business and development, data and research functions. Um, Harry uh, is a 1978 graduate of Princeton University and a 1981 graduate of the University of South Carolina Law School. A fixture of South Carolina's business community for decades, Mr. Lightsey served in top executive leadership roles for major corporations in South Carolina and across the nation. Notably, he served as the president of Bell South Telecommunications for South Carolina prior to the company's merger with AT&T and afterward becoming president for AT&T's Southeast region. He was appointed by Governor Henry McMaster to serve as Secretary of Commerce in June 2021. Pat holds an undergraduate degree in political science with a focus in international relations from the University of Georgia. Uh, he served on the staff of Governor Sonny Perdue as a Director of Government Affairs. Mr. Wilson joined the Georgia Department of Economic Development in 2010 as Deputy Commissioner for Global Commerce and later became the Chief Operating Officer. He was appointed Commissioner in November 2016 and currently leads the state agency responsible for creating jobs and investment opportunities in Georgia. Again, I'd like to welcome all our panelists. And with that, I'd like to jump into the first question. Um, so uh, I'm actually glad to be asking these questions because normally we talk about uh, security and political developments. And these days, uh, they're not very positive, both on the <laughs> Korean Peninsula as well as globally. And it's often said that economics is the dismal science. Perhaps that's still true at the macro level as we see what's going on in the U.S. and, and, uh, and the world. But on the micro level, I think there's a wonderfully positive story unfolding uh, in uh, the southeast U.S. and particularly in investment into this region. So can each of you provide an introduction to your respective economic uh, development entities? Um, I notice that institutionally, they range from a state-level Department of Commerce uh, a state-level Department of Economic Development Commission, and a private economic development corporation. So when were you established? Why were you established? And, uh, and, and like, like how, 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 do you, how do you function? Um, maybe, Andrew, we could start with you. Well, Tom, thank you for the invitation to participate. Um, as you mentioned, I represent Jobs Ohio. We're Ohio's private economic development corporation. Uh, we were formed in 2011. Uh, we're about 125 people now. And uh, we're unique in three ways uh, in particular. One, our private structure. Uh, we have sector teams that focused on industries of the future from advanced manufacturing and IT to healthcare and finance. Um, and so a big chunk of our team are former industry veterans. Um, so our private structure with our sector teams is unique. Uh, second is our funding structure. We uh, were a privatized entity and uh, we're funded through a 25-year lease of the state liquor enterprise. So we have a long-term funding stream, uh, and we use that for grants, loans, and other forms of assistance. And then third is our regional structure. Ohio has very diverse regions um, from Cincinnati, Columbus, and Cleveland to Dayton, Toledo, and Appalachia. And we yeah. work as a team across those six regions to conduct economic development. Okay, good. Harry? Yeah, so just let me start off by... Uh, once again, saying I'm, how honored I am to, to be here. Uh, it's really interesting. I think South Carolina has had a, a long and unique history with uh, Korea. Uh, and I personally have. I majored in East Asian studies in undergraduate school. And then um, a close personal family friend was uh, Richard Walker, who was the ambassador to Korea uh, from South Carolina. Um, 
the U.S. ambassador to Korea during the 1980s. Uh, my father-in-law, uh, Donald Weatherby, uh, taught uh, in Korea and, and specialized in uh, Asian policy studies. So uh, it's, a, it's a personal connection. Just um, very briefly about uh, our department, we kind of emerged uh, out of uh, economic hardship uh, in, in the early uh, 20th century as the economy shifted from uh, agrarian to industrial uh, was the predecessor of our department. And then in the 1960s, uh, when our economy suffered the loss of many textile jobs, we were kind of reconstituted. And then finally, in the 1990s, um, we uh, were incorporated as a, as a cabinet level agency reporting directly to the governor and uh, I serve at the, at the pleasure of the governor. Good, thanks. And Pat? Uh, yeah, so uh, the Georgia Department of Economic Development was actually created in 1949. Uh, we are a, an executive level uh, cabinet uh, agency, which means that I'm appointed by the governor. Um, you know, it's a very simple mission for the Georgia Department of Economic Development. We're, we're tasked with creating jobs uh, and opportunities in every corner of the state um, just like Andrew said, that's, uh, we have a very diverse, large state. Um, so we focus our efforts on anything, uh, that can potentially create jobs. And so we have a, uh, while it's a simple mission, we have a broad reach. Mm -hmm. Um, we actually of course have business recruitment and, uh, existing industry growth, but at the same time we focus on international trade, tourism, uh, film and the arts. Uh, the one thing that ties all those uh, things together, all those divisions, is the thread of, of job creation in every corner of the state. So uh, we have a broad uh, organization that really focuses on uh, creating opportunities for Georgians. Okay, great. Um, okay, my next question, I think I'll start with a, a, a global overview and drill down to the, uh, to the state level. And, and the, what I'd like to get at is how, how are the uh, macro factors, uh, global macro factors affecting um, investment in each of your states. So um, at, at the beginning of the year, uh, Kearney, the, the uh, consulting firm noted that uh, global business leaders were optimistic about the global investment outlook for 2022. Uh, however, uh, subsequent geopolitical shocks are now remaking the world and probably uh, hopes for a robust economy, at least globally. Uh, there were also economic shocks, as we see with uh, inflation and fear of recession. Uh, foreign direct investment flows in 2021 uh, strongly rebounded. That's last year from the pandemic lows, but remained far below the 2.1 trillion uh, peak hit in 2016. Um, so how are these global shocks uh, uh, playing out? Are they affecting um, do you detect any, any effect on investment flows uh, into your country, foreign direct investment flows? Um, why don't we start with Pat? This sure. Um, Tom, you know, it, it's been interesting that coming out of the recession in 2010 to where we are today, uh, we have seen arguably the most prosperous 10-year, uh, 12-year period in the history of the state as far as diversity of the economy is uh, job creation and really foreign investment right. uh, mm -hmm. reaching levels that we've never seen before. Um, even with all the shocks that we're seeing across the world and the impact uh, that that's having economically in the United States, um, we are setting records right now in both job creation and investment uh, coming from companies uh, all across the world. Um, but we're seeing actually increase in uh in fdi in fact last year we saw a 20 percent increase in uh, jobs that were created by companies uh, from foreign investment um, while i think the global impact is being felt every day by people uh, at the gas pump or at the grocery store uh, we are not seeing a significant change in uh, companies plans to do business in the united states mm -hmm. well that's good and um, Harry. Yeah, so um, I think very similar to, to Georgia, uh, South Carolina's governor uh, made the uh, fairly bold decision at the time, I think during the, the pandemic uh, to keep uh, South Carolina open for business and, and all of our manufacturing businesses were declared essential. So uh, the pandemic itself really had no real impact on uh, South Carolina's businesses. But I think if you look at it more broadly, uh, we are at a really 
very special point in time uh, where that I think is an inflection point that's going to transform uh, businesses around the globe uh, for the future. And we're seeing these technologies like uh, the conversion in the automobile industry to the uh, uh, battery electric vehicle, uh, other technologies such as robot, robotics and artificial intelligence and other smart uh, technologies, uh, the huge uh, shift into sustainable uh, sustainability and the impact on the environment. I think these are kind of mega factors that are driving businesses to make decisions that are beyond kind of the short term uh, economic impacts of, of where we sit today, but are, they're looking you know, decades into the future. And I think they're making their decisions based on that. And I think, you know, we're seeing the same trends that Pat is seeing uh, because of that, mm -hmm. uh, which is a general lift in, in interest of uh, companies, global right. companies in investing. Right. right. And Andrew. Tom, in, in economic development, you'll find a lot of optimists, right. but even setting aside that orientation, the, the data take you to a place where the, the outlook is bright. Um, and uh, we are, like Georgia, coming off a record year last year. Um, it included some notable Korean wins, uh, such as LG, Cam, and, and Ravenna, Ohio. Uh, but our pipeline, what we see in our pipeline is, is very encouraging. Uh, we started off uh, 2022 with a big win with Intel Corporation, building out what they're calling the Silicon Heartland um, in terms of semiconductor mm -hmm. manufacturing. But in terms of FDI, uh, the, the pipeline is, is as full as it's been, uh, but particularly with regards to Korean companies. Right. Um, again, looking at it, we'll get to Korea, but looking at the, uh, the, the, the big picture, uh, the, the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis points out, I think, two interesting facts that are common in, in all of your three states, um, Ohio, South Carolina, and Georgia, and that one uh, the, the, the jobs created by foreign direct investment in each of your states is higher than the U.S. national average. So you must be doing something right in, in, in your states. Um, could you talk more about what are you doing right? Why, why do firms come to your states and, and employ people? Um, start with Ohio. So Ohio, we're, we're America's seventh largest state. We're about 12 million people and a workforce just under 6 million. And so if you, you double click into the workforce, uh, there are over 1,000 international company, companies operating in Ohio, employing over 300,000 people. Um, it's about 40% uh, from Asia, 40% from Europe, and 20% from the rest of the world. And I think it goes back, honestly, to the 1970s and 80s when Honda made their flagship investment in, the, in, in Ohio. Um, and we built from there. Um, and I think, you know, uh, when we work with companies, there's what the spreadsheet says, and then there's how they feel. And I think on international uh, projects, it's important to get that balance right and make sure everyone is feeling welcomed. Right, right. And in South Carolina. Yeah, so uh, South Carolina is a, is a small state geographically. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that uh, historically, because of that, South Carolina has always been uh, trade oriented and, and looking uh, beyond its its borders uh, for growth uh, to support uh, the quality of life for our citizens. And uh, so I think that is actually something we have a very big similarity with uh, Korea with with regard to. Uh, it's interesting. We have a company called KRA Operations. It's a Korean company. They made their first uh, global investment outside of Korea and in, in South Carolina in 2020 and uh and then uh they've already announced an expansion of that investment and the ceo of the company said uh, that they were making that expansion decision based on uh, first-rate customer service uh a a workforce that is uh globally mm -hmm. competitive and uh a sustained uh business friendly environment and frankly i i couldn't have said it any better i think that's what uh, South Carolina wants to stand for, and I think that's historically uh, what we have stood for. And the, the companies that locate in South Carolina uh, find our environment to be very business friendly and very conducive to success, and and that's what uh, helps. Right. And, and turning to Georgia, yeah, uh, you know, it's interesting. I think Tom, you're going to find a lot of commonalities in a lot of these questions that we. Um, you know, job creation is a very competitive nature. Uh, we all place a premium on making sure that that uh, that we are creating great jobs for our citizens, and and so that sharpens the the knives, right? And we all are 
uh, do some things that I think uh, very specifically to help companies continue to grow. And I think uh, both Andrew and, and Harry hit some points that I, that we share. Uh, one of the things that I think sets us apart and makes us unique uh, is connectivity and being able to reach the world. Uh, you know, Georgia through Hartsville Jackson International Airport is the world's busiest airport, uh, world's most traveled. Uh, we have 12 flights a week directly to Seoul, but really you can reach the world uh, out of Hartsville Jackson International Airport, the fastest growing port in the United States. Um, you know, that connectivity is so important in getting your people and your goods to market. Mm -hmm. Um, but we also, and I think uh, South Carolina has a similar story, that as we were coming out of uh, the textile uh, doldrums, when companies picked up and moved to Mexico, when companies picked up and, and took their, uh, the, the textile industry elsewhere, we looked to upskill our people. Uh, we looked to upskill Georgians and help them find the jobs of the future. Uh, one of the things that attracts companies to Georgia are our, our job training programs. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's never more important than today when everybody in the United States is experiencing uh, record unemployment. And so the guarantee that if you move to Georgia, that we are going to work with you to make sure you have that workforce that's going to make you profitable over the long run. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what really has has been a driving factor right, for us. Right, right. Um, so Korea is a global juggernaut in, in trade. For the U.S., it's the uh, sixth largest, or sixth most important trading partner. Um, however, in foreign di direct investment, it, it completely lags in that position. It's also the 10th largest economy in the world, uh, South Korea. It, uh, I think, a distant 14th, I mean, down there with smaller countries like Belgium and Singapore, if I remember right, in terms of cumulative foreign direct investment in the U.S. over the years. And then another commonality in your states is that looking at the historical record through 2020, uh, Japan has been the largest source of foreign direct investment over the years, a cumulative dollar amount of investment in your countries. And Korea is a way, way distant from that number one pole position. Now that's from 2020. I, I get a sense as we titled, hence the title of this conversation, uh, Catching the K Investment Wave. Um, that things have changed since then. Um, maybe you could talk about, you know, what's going on. What was it like, you know, more than several years ago in terms of Korean interest in investing in your state and, and what's going on now? Um, Pat, you want to start with, sure. with Georgia? Um, Tom, you're, you're spot on. I mean, you look at Georgia opened our first international office in 1973. Um, so then Governor Jimmy Carter opened an office in uh, Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And so there is a long history of, of Japanese investment employment in, uh, in Georgia and, and really across the South and, and the United States. We opened our office in Seoul in 1985. Uh, and since then have had a, a long-term uh, relationship with, with many companies uh, in Korea. We didn't see our first Korean investment until 1996. So if you think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have many decades of investment from Japan, uh, 1996 SKC moved to Covington, Georgia and opened a facility that's still growing, still changing. Uh, we just actually had a, a major announcement of, of SK Hynex uh, coming to that facility to, to make uh, uh, subwafers for semiconductor chips. Mm -hmm. um, so it is, it, it's continuing to evolve. Uh, but from 1996 to 2006, when Kia located to Georgia, mm -hmm. we saw a small bit of growth. Kia locates, mm -hmm. um, we have seen exponential growth after that. And then if you look at the last five years, um, SK uh, Batteries uh, located a facility in Georgia, which at the time was the largest investment in the history of the state. Followed by this year, we have uh, Hyundai, which announced its first electric vehicle facility that they're going to mm -hmm. uh, manufacture electric vehicles in Savannah, Georgia. That's an 8,100 job project and $5.5 billion of investment. So if you pl plotted this out on a graph, uh, what begins is a very slow curve has now turned into a, a massive uh, peak. Right. Uh, is something similar happen, happening in South Carolina, Harry? Yeah, so I think we're uh, probably a, a few years uh, behind Georgia in terms of, of where we are. Uh, we established our uh, office in Seoul, Korea uh, just uh, in the last decade. 
And five years ago, we saw our first significant uh, investment from Samsung. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll celebrate their fifth uh, anniversary in South Carolina this month. And we're very excited about that and very excited about their success. They've expanded twice uh, since they first came to South Carolina. Uh, but we're starting mm -hmm. to see uh, many more companies uh, from Korea invest uh, are looking at South Carolina. I think uh, part of this wave, as we mentioned, is this transition uh, that's going on globally uh, in the automobile industry that's driving a lot of investment, uh, the battery investments that uh, we just mentioned in Georgia and Hyundai's uh, massive investment around the battery electric vehicle. Uh, and we're seeing similar interest. And those are, but those are areas that Korea has established a global leadership position in. And so it's only natural that where they are leading globally, they're starting to look to expand their uh, impact. Right. And Ohio. So, so in our work, uh, about four out of five companies we're with are, are based in the U.S., but one out of five uh, are international projects. And uh, we focus on 10 international markets, including Korea. Uh, we're represented in Seoul by uh, Mr. Young Ho So. And uh, really over the past five years, he's built quite a pipeline of opportunities right. for us to work on. And so I would describe Ohio as an emerging market for, for Korean investment. We have several dozen uh, successful operations in the state today. Uh, a few examples would be uh, Hyundai Mobis in Toledo, uh, which is uh, near the Jeep assembly plant, uh, Knox Corporation in, in Fostoria, they're in, in the vinyl floor business. Um, and Cosmax in Northeast Ohio. So I, I could go on, but uh, it's not just the large companies. It's also very successful uh, middle market companies. And, um, you know, as, as Pat's described, we're in the business of providing solutions and, and, and that could be real estate solutions, talent solutions. And um, we're designed to uh, support companies as quickly as they would like to be supported. Right. Yeah. Well, um, even though you call yourself an emerging market, we, we discovered you last year at our annual uh, 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 dinner where we gave our Van Fleet Award, the, the award to companies and individuals who promote Korea, U.S. Korea relations to the GM LG EV battery joint venture, uh, which I think started in Ohio and will, will spread to the southeast to Tennessee, I believe. Um, yeah, so, um, I mean, Pat, you talked about how companies or you know, you encourage companies to invest and you make com uh, investment attractive by pro providing co connectivity, just I guess your geographical location. Um, you also have large ports on, on the Atlantic Ocean, which are an advantage. Um, often casually when you read um, the newspapers, you, you know, when a large foreign firm seeks to invest, even a domestic firm in a certain location, uh, the newspapers always talk about tax incentives and handouts given to, to, to corporations to make it more attractive. Um, a question to everybody, uh, you know, how important are these financial and economic incentives at the local level? And I can weave in another uh, aspect of this question here. Uh, what role does the federal government play in this? Is, is a bill, competing bills in Congress, in the lower house and in the Senate on uh, making, uh, improving innovation and competitiveness in, in high tech areas in the U.S.? So, uh, I mean, in the in the big picture, maybe um, Andrew, you could talk about this first. Uh, how how important are these financial and economic incentives to attracting investment? It's a great question, Tom. In Ohio, we talk about the four pillars uh, of our value proposition: uh, the business climate that gets into tax structure, et cetera; uh, the workforce, which mm -hmm. is you know usually issue number one right. and two: what's the availability and what's the cost. Uh, what's the innovation ecosystem? Are you building for industries of the future? Mm -hmm. And then fourth, quality of life. Um, and so we can usually ascribe uh, wins and, and opportunities to those four pillars. And, um, you know, for some companies, incentives are at the top of the list and for others, they're, they're further down. But uh, that's where we're there to uh, help break a tie and um, tip the balance towards Ohio. So it, it's an important issue. Um, and what I do think the U.S. has become more competitive, wh whether it's the federal tax reform, whether it's the pending right. uh, Competes Act, which you referenced, um, to send a signal to companies that, that, that the U.S. is investing for the future. Um, and, and, and given Intel's announcement, you know, we stand to benefit. Um, but, but clearly, a lot of the actions at the state level, mm -hmm. and, and you can see that in the different organizational right. designs we have, the different programs we have, 
Um, and, we're, and we're proud to do that work on the behalf of the people of Ohio. Great. Okay. And South Carolina, Harry. Yeah. So very similar. Um, I mean, I think obviously uh, the incentive structures are, are there to provide uh, solutions uh, to the businesses that are looking to, to be here to uh, help them uh, figure out their, their cost uh, of, of being in our, in our state. I think in the long run, uh, everybody sees the value of these investments uh, to the citizenry of, of our state. Uh, you know, the impact uh, on quality of life is, is measurable and it's, it's uh, very positive. So I think the incentives uh, stand for themselves in terms of the value that they bring to the states with uh, with uh, foreign direct investment. And uh, I think uh, workforce is incredibly important. Uh, we have, uh, since the 1960s, uh, relied heavily on our technical uh, school system and our research universities, uh, and we continue to do that and to create uh, programs that uh, will provide the skills to our workers uh, for tomorrow's jobs. and. Uh, and we're very excited about that as well. Right, right, okay. And uh, Pat with, with uh, Georgia. Yeah, Tom, I, I kind of um, divide this into two, two, mm -hmm. two answers and talk a little bit about the incentive piece. Mm -hmm. um, when we look at incentives, and I, Andrew mentioned this, that we really mm -hmm. focus on solutions for the, the, for the company itself. And so many times uh, right now in this world, as we're seeing uh, with many of these global trends and companies, uh, whether it's uh, renewable energy or whether you're looking at electrification of automotive, speed to market is the most important issue and being able to produce your product <clears throat> as quickly as possible. Uh, and so we really focus our incentives on helping companies accomplish that speed to market goal. Mm -hmm. And so we know that these companies are making the investment. Uh, you know, the United States is like 50 little countries uh, that are all competing for that opportunity. Right. And mm -hmm. so the incentives... Uh, put in the right place and focused in the right way, help companies uh, make that, that long-term investment. Uh, but it's more than that. This really is the state and the local uh, community uh, investing together with the company. And, and one of the things that I've said um, over and over again, if you move to Georgia and you employ Georgians, you're a Georgia company. We're looking at this as a 50 year investment. This is a long-term mm -hmm. relationship. And so it truly is the the incentives that are provided to a company mm -hmm. is a joint investment with right, that company. Right. So I think that that is, it stands alone. We all have our own mm -hmm. system of making sure that the taxpayer dollar is protected. Mm -hmm. um, and so that ultimately is the goal. But as uh, Harry said, um, we recognize that jobs change lives. Mm -hmm. The jobs are the long-term health of a community. And that's why we place a premium on it. Um, so I'm, I'm very much for states right. participating, right. uh, when it comes to the federal government, um, I, you know, I've, I've said this earlier, if I've, I worked in DC a very long time, um, I think if the federal government can make investments that help companies grow and lower regulations mm -hmm. and make it easier for companies to expand, mm -hmm. um, then that's a positive. Right. That's right. all we got right. there. Right. Um, are, are those, um. I mean, are, th are those trends working in, in your in your favor? The, are the political winds blowing in your in, in your favor? I mean, uh, Washington's stance towards regulation, Washington's potential stance towards corporate taxation, perhaps increasing corporate taxes back to the, where they were uh, before the um, previous administration reduced them. Are these uh, are these things that? Um, what I would, would always ask when I was a Moody's analyst uh, in a wrap-up question, are these, thing, are these things that uh, keep you up at night or in line with the uh, title of this, uh, of this conversation, Riding the K Investment Wave? I mean, could, what would lead to a wipeout? Are there, what, what do you think the biggest risks are to um, riding this investment wave further, not just from Korean companies, but other foreign companies coming into your states? You know, I, I think Harry said it very eloquently earlier that we are seeing these global trends in manufacturing right now that are really mm -hmm. driving the necessity for investment. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that these investments are going to happen regardless of uh, policy in Washington. Um, that being said, Washington can definitely do things that slow things down. Uh, raising taxation in the middle of inflation 
Uh, if you think about a project that we announced today um, that is going to be you know, begin construction, say this mm -hmm. summer or you know then fall, um, every day that we wait to start moving mm -hmm. to start moving dirt, the cost of that project goes up tremendously. Mm -hmm. And so, in the face of of rising inflation um, and companies making long term and major investments decisions. Um, you know, raising taxes is absolutely going to slow that down. Okay. Um, how do you see things, Harry? Uh, what, what, what concerns you? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, the same thing as Pat. I, I will say that anything that the, the federal uh, government does that enables us to be more competitive mm -hmm. is, is a plus, and anything they do that, that makes us less competitive globally, right. it's a minus. And I think that's the key is that we have to understand that this really is a global mm -hmm. global. Uh, game that we're in right. and it's we're in competition not only with with each other and the other states and in, in the united states but uh with countries around around the world mm -hmm. and uh and you know the factors uh that have been mentioned in terms of what companies uh are being driven uh to to consider in making their investment uh, decisions mm -hmm. uh cost and speed to market uh, and uh, the quality of the workforce that, uh, that can support their business, you know, those are the those are the key factors, and and that's uh, that's where we have to uh, be very globally competitive and globally conscious. Right. Andrew, you want to add to that? Using your analogy of, of the the K wave of investment, right. I, you know, I think it's our hope that that's still cresting, and um, we we've, we've talked in Ohio about. Uh, what we feel is a generational opportunity after the pandemic, um, whether it's regarding open, secure supply chains, uh, sort of the, the Midwest resurgence, um, you know, the momentum we have with recent wins. So I, I think a lot of the companies we're working with are making these long-term bets. And so uh, we're there to support them long-term, grow with them, provide them stability when they need it. Uh, certainly the near term outlook is, is cloudier than it was. Um, but I think the good news is a lot of the firms we're working with are making these long term bets mm -hmm. and, and, you know, notwithstanding what's happened, what happens over the next 12 to 24 months, those will, those will be smart investments, uh, and, and we'll be there to support them. Right. Right. Um, you know, something I wanted to get to earlier, but I'll, I'll mention it now. Um, so talking about the fundamental, fundamental forces that are driving, uh, investment, uh, into your economies. Um, you know, the U.S. Uh, at one time was, did free trade agreements. Um, other countries in Asia are still doing them, uh, such as the uh, TPP, the Comprehensive and um, uh, Progressive uh, uh, TPP, um, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, there's, there's a new one now. Uh, China's the biggest member, uh, RCEP, Regional and Comprehensive Economic Partnership. And so the Biden administration has proposed this, uh, this, this framework. It's not a trade pact. It doesn't go to Congress. Uh, it doesn't lower trade barriers, um, tariffs, or anything like that. Um, it's the uh, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. I think I got that acronym right. I, I mean, how, how do you see these influencing the, the these trade pacts, these trade frameworks, or how have they influenced investment inflows into into your states? Do you see any tangible connection? I don't know if we see any tangible connection mm -hmm. yet, but I think that the concept of a framework is a is a uh, is a good concept. Mm -hmm. I think it anything that uh, enhances uh, communication yeah. uh, between countries is is a mm -hmm. is a good thing. Uh, having a frame for what framework kind of allows us, uh, flexibility right. to right. to adapt to uh, rapidly changing mm -hmm. uh, conditions. Right. And so, uh, you know, I think it's, it's definitely a, a good, uh, yeah. good step in the right direction. Right. Yeah. I, w I would add that um, this conversation is well-timed. We have a, a new ambassador here in the U.S., a new ambassador headed to Korea. We have Select USA in a couple weeks in Washington, uh, a signature program in the Department of Commerce. And uh, they have been a very helpful and constructive national leadership voice. Um, there's a supply chain working group. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that is all part of this broader table setting of a framework. So uh, I, I think uh, we're very supportive. And to your point, it may be too early to tell, but um, clearly the, the priorities that have been set out would, would be ones that would be pro-growth. Okay, good. Yeah. And I, I, I would echo that. I mean, I feel like we've, uh, we're, our states are probably very similar in, 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 uh, in how we view this. Mm -hmm. I've benefit from a governor who is very pro-free trade. Uh, right. And so anything, again, 
that makes us more competitive globally and makes our companies uh, more competitive globally is a net positive. Uh, we actually make, you know, we have 12 international offices um, and we make our decisions on where to invest and where to put those office based on mm -hmm. free trade agreements. Right. Um, anytime we can strengthen uh, ties between our two countries and lower barriers right. uh, for trade back and forth is a great positive for us. Well, well, that's good to hear because, um, I mean, open trading systems and open economies have benefited the, the world so much. And, Absolutely. you know, this, this uh, talk about deglobalization is actually quite worrying, I think, for the uh, welfare of the, not just the U.S., but the whole world. Um, I, I think we only have a couple more minutes left, so maybe I could ask you to uh, each of you to make a, a, a closing observation or statement, and and the uh, to use to keep up with this metaphor, this K investment wave that is uh, that I think is is, is swelling in, in your states in particular. Uh, do you see this rising rising further? Will this be uh, uh, sort of the, the mavericks of investment in uh, in, in in the U.S. and investment into your economies? I'm going to jump on this first because okay. I think we're all going to answer very similarly and I'm tired of them stepping, stepping on my answers. <laughs> uh, I, look, I, I think that we're seeing it. Uh, we've talked about it. Um, Korean investment is growing at a rate that is eclipsing uh, every other country right now in, in uh, not only in the announcements that we're having made, uh, but also in the pipeline uh, coming out of Korea. It, it's interesting that, that for years and years, uh, Korea has been in our top, you know, five investor countries over, probably over the last 10 years. Last year, they jumped to number one for the first time. Uh, and with Hyundai announcing, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that they will be number one again this year. Mm -hmm. uh, but you think about just all of the cutting edge uh, companies, the research that's coming out of Korea uh, whether you're Hanwha Q cells, whether you are Samsung, whether you're mm -hmm. uh, SK Battery, um, of course, Kia, Hyundai, uh, all of these companies are on the major cutting edge of transitions that are happening across multiple right. industries. Right. That is not going to stop. Right. Yeah. It, it seems like Korea's uh, premium on education is, is, is paying off now as uh, these strategic and sustainable uh, investments and in industries are rising to the forefront. Well, even if you go back to mm -hmm kind of the way you started, Tom, talking about how the Korea society is focused for many years on political, um, the, the political back and forth military. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also just geopolitically, it's mm -hmm. investing in our allies as well. And I do think that we as the United States and as Korea uh, have this tie that is very different than many of our other relationships around the world. It's unique. And I think that that Korean companies are going to continue to look to the United States for mm -hmm. the safest place to do business right. and really geopolitically the the place where they need to be doing business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no economic retaliation here if uh, <laughs> something right. doesn't happen uh, uh, to the pleasure of the leaders somewhere. Um, uh, Andrew, do you have? Uh... So if you go back in time uh, in a normal year, we would work on you know, a handful of projects with Korean companies and that number is currently over 20. And so uh, I think the main message we want to send is, is that we're stable, long-term team focused on the future and we're ready to support uh, that growth. And, um, you know, the solutions aren't one size fits all for some companies. They value a grant more than a talent service. Mm -hmm. um, but we've really doubled our mission at, at Jobs Ohio and we're investing a lot in Ohio's competitiveness. Uh, through innovation districts, through um, anticipatory site investments. So we have a lot more sites than we used to. Um, and then in, in kind of talent growth. So those, that's where we're placing our bet uh, to keep pushing the business climate forward. Uh, and that'll be benefit all, all companies, including Korean companies. Right. And Harry? Yeah. So I'll just uh, wrap up by saying with uh, South Carolina, uh, we recently created a vision statement, and that vision statement is that we will embrace the future to secure uh, South Carolina's sustainable advantage. Mm. And I think, uh, you know, that's really uh, what we want to focus on. Uh, I think that uh, we want to uh, the, the folks uh, in, in Korea to know that we are excited uh, to and honored that they're considering us uh, for making investments, and our commitment is to partner with them uh, for their success at the local level, at the state level, and at the federal level. 
and uh, they can count on our support uh, for the long run. Uh, we've been a business-friendly climate for decades, and we will continue to be a business-friendly uh, climate into the future, and, and we look forward to working with them. Yeah. Well, um, um, Andrew, Harry, and Pat, thanks for sharing your, your insights and uh, improving our understanding of how things work at the, at, at the state level. And um, I mean, I, I didn't hear much dismal, uh, uh, <laughs> I didn't get much dismal uh, vibes here. In fact, it's been wonderfully positive. So uh, best wishes and keep up the good work. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.